Welcome, everyone, to another week of the PM Show. I am your host, Mandy Parsons, and usually I have John Moreland with me, but John has, I think, decided to go wrestle alligators or something tonight. So I have the fabulous, the great Danica the Great with me again this week. Hello, Miss Danica. Oh, okay, who who bribed you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's more like how much did I bribe you to be on with me for another week and save my tale of having to bore the audience just listening to me for two hours straight. Oh, well, you know, we probably could entertain them more than wrestling alligators. I mean, really, I mean, who who wrestles alligators? Like, psh, boring. <laughs> I, I think that he's in the market for a new job and maybe just came across this lucrative opportunity of wrestling alligators. Um, I don't, he didn't really say he's wrestling alligators, but that's the story that I'm going to stick to. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so I will start out this week with a little tidbit of information. If you are taking a nap and there's a song you really, really like, I don't suggest making it your alarm clock song when you set it on your phone. Oh man, I um, <laughs> this is this is kind of a, a nerdy thing. Oh, and by the way, if I didn't say thank you for having me on here, so I said thank you, thank you everybody for listening. I'm hopefully I didn't scare you away from last week, but uh, I have um, it, it's it's a very nerdy uh, confession to find, but I play Skyrim a lot, and my ringtone is the Fusro Da Yell from Skyrim. If you have a chance to YouTube it or anything, look it up. It's just a very loud. Um, yell and it breaks out into song and it's very very loud and I um, got a call from my doctor's office uh, this couple of days ago confirmed from our appointment and they call at 8:45 a.m. which you know still it's technically not too early for them to call the you know the allowable general times are between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. so I guess it was when the, as in the time limit but I had never gotten a call that early and it jolted me out of a deep sleep and scared me half to death so. Uh, I I can definitely sympathize you with a very loud ringtone waking you up. <laughs> I don't like having to set the alarm to begin with, but if I am going to set the alarm, you know, usually I'm thinking, oh, you know, maybe something pleasant, something that I like to listen to. But then I realize mm-hmm. the more it wakes me up, the more I start hating the song. So it's really it's really a problem there. Do you wake up with a song you like or and take the risk of hating it or do you just choose something you don't like so you hate it anyway? It's a it's a total catch twenty two. Yeah, if you hate it then you have more reason to shut it off first thing in the morning. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So we are calling this episode uh the Vagina Chapters two point oh. Uh Woo! considering that we were both during this last week. Now, we had um, Ken the Liberty Phoenix join us last week. Um, I don't know if he'll be calling in. I told him he could if he wanted to, Uh, but uh, you always have filled in in a pinch. I love having you on, and I think that every time I hear you on the air, you improve greatly. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm slowly getting over my shyness, and I um, am getting more comfortable talking I have a couple of different, how should I say, hang-ups, I guess, about myself um, when I'm talking in front of people. I mean, most of us absolutely hate taking Communications 101 or whatever it is where we all have to write speeches in either high school or college. I think college is a bit of more of a hang-up, but most people tend to get very nervous when they're talking in front of their peers or even when they hold a crowd, they tend to shake um, and get very nervous. And I do the same thing because when, if, if I'm in front of Mike, I may not be necessarily within like a crowd of hundreds of people, but here I am having, you know, my opinions and my voice recorded. And I just, it, it's a very silly hangout, but I was just thinking, you know, they're going to maybe I'll say something like completely dumb and they're going to take, you know, make it into like a little clip and use it as a drop, which would be even more embarrassing. But I guess, you know, you just, when you're in this kind of thing, you, really have to learn how to laugh at yourself. So every you know, every time that I'm on dive on it, I've been on another uh podcast and you know, as time goes on I'm becoming just more and more comfortable with myself, um, learning to talk slowly, enunciate properly because I have a habit of sometimes slurring my words because I'm talking way too fast and um I can't process my brain as fast so things come out very hurriedly or um sometimes I mash words together or don't pronounce them correctly. So um, I appreciate you ha- having me on here and allowing me to work some of those out. 
Oh, sure. It's it's a lot easier to do it, too, when you have uh, somebody that you enjoy talking to immensely that uh, you consider a really great friend. So it makes the two hours easier for me as well. So I'm I'm equally Uh benefiting from the opportunity. And I'll tell you, I think the best thing about radio is um, recently I had an interview, and I'll go into the interviews in a minute, uh, with a school district who I guess I guess their screening process to weed out all the people um, from being able just to have random phone calls and, uh, you know, for, for jobs that are available. I guess they go through a screening process where they call people first and they say that you have to teach a, a five-minute lesson over the phone. So I had oh, wow. to go through this screening process with the county. It was It's the strangest interview probably I've ever had, but... I went through this um, this interview, and by the time it was said and done, the lady who was doing the interview over the phone with me, uh, she said, you'll hear from the school about the next step in the process. And my stepmom's like, oh, you know, that's really weird. My stepmom is a nationally acclaimed um, special education teacher. She's very, very, very good at what she does. She's one of my mentors. Um, she's She's so talented. So if I am one fourth of the teacher that she is, I'm going to be amazing. Um, but she w- I was telling her about this interview. She's like, that is a strange interview. I've never had to teach something over the phone. And she's like, do you do you have a script? I mean, what are you what are you going to do? I told mm-hmm. her, I said, well, you know, I have I have my outline ready to go, but doing this interview over the phone was really no different than being on the radio. And I told her, I said, I'm going to be okay, I think. I do this every week over the radio. And I'd like to think that our listening audience uh, here at Freedomizer and anybody involved in our liberty movement are more forgiving and more accepting of what everyone has to say regardless of yeah, their hang-ups about themselves on the air. So I think you're among friendly people here, and I think that they are just appreciative that you're with us. Awesome. Well, God, yeah, thank you for uh, for giving me the encouraging words. And uh, if you ever need me on as a co-host, I'm more than happy to do it, unless, of course, obviously I'm busy or have something else to do. But uh, my evenings are pretty free, pretty relaxed. So this is um, this is a great way for me to work out those hangouts and, you know, of course, get to hang out with you because you're pretty cool people um, and, you know, get to meet new friends. Um, I've been getting a lot of friend requests on Facebook, actually, and I you know, believe, you know, uh, pretty much all of them, um, we have mutual friends with, but it was, I just, um, I know a couple of people from Freedomizer Radio have friended me, and it's just, you know, they were giving me compliments saying how calm and how easy it was on the air and how great the show was. So it's it's been very, uh, very encouraging. That's really neat. And I think I think being on the radio is very empowering to think that people are listening to the message that you have to say. I think that's what I enjoyed best when I was taking my, my radio classes at the university when I was getting my degree, that everybody said, well, why do you want to do radio? You don't make any money in radio. And I said it was never about the money to begin with. It was all about spreading a message to the masses and having the power to be able to influence people in a positive way. So I think that's the best thing about doing this. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I have a big question. Now, how long now has it been since you moved to New Hampshire? Uh, It's been about a month, a little bit over, probably about five weeks, maybe, five, six weeks. Tell me a little bit what it's been like since you moved. I know that if you live in the state and you are part of the Free State Project, that they have events and gatherings and outside of Porkfest, I mean, um, have you gotten to be involved? Have you gotten gone to any of these meetups, these gatherings that they have? Oh yeah, um, we've been, um, I've been to a lot actually. Um, I um, I don't know if you if you know of Rich Paul or of any of the things that have been surrounding him. Have you? Before I go on, I know his name. Can you elaborate a little bit on him? Sure. Um, so. I'm going to try and describe what I know of Rich Paul, and if anyone here is listening and knows more clarification or if I'm sprouting off something wrong, please, by all means, um, call in and uh, correct me. 
But basically, Ron Paul, not Ron Paul, goodness, Rich Paul is a hero um, to the livery movement, mostly because um, when he was charged with a, when he was charged with a crime um, a couple, I believe it was a couple of years ago, um, he was offered a plea deal where the FBI was going to be attaching a wire to him, and he was going to be infiltrating places such as um, the King Activist Center, um, all of the different meetings. Uh, Things like that that the government definitely doesn't approve of and in exchange for a short sentence, and he absolutely refused. So he refused the plea deal, and he was thrown in jail. And he was thrown in jail for about, oh, I want to say, 13, 14 months. So right there, he's a hero because he absolutely refused to betray um, He refused to betray his friends. He refused to betray um, the liberty movement in general because he, feel that he felt that he did nothing wrong. So um, another th- so. Um, when I moved to Keene, uh, Rich had only been out of jail for a few months, so it was really good to meet him. I had met him at Liberty Forum. Um, it's been very awesome to get to know him, get to know his ways, um, just really understand his activism because he's led um, 420 meetings in the square where they would all gather out and they would smoke pot um, in, you know, in an attempt to try and legalize marijuana. Now, unfortunately, Rich Paul um, has, been, uh, has been in jail again, and the reason why is because uh, during the chalk wars down in the Central Square in Keene, um, some people were coming, threatening him with violence. And in order to protect himself, he took out his camera to use this kind of defense uh, mechanism. And uh, it was caught on it, it was caught on tape. And when the feds found out about it, they they arrested him because they are stating he violated his parole by using it as a weapon. Uh, the first charge was saying that he used it as a billy club, which you can tell, definitely tell by the video that it's not a billy club, that it's a camera tripod. Um, so that, you know, there's a charge there that now, um, after a couple of weeks of going to the um, county courthouse, which I have been able to go to, I've gone to pretty much all of his trials. Um, we're now arranging times to visit him in jail. Um you know, this trial is ongoing, so that's another event that we've been going to, trying to get them to reduce his sentence, trying to get him out of there. So that's been a huge event that we've all been a part of. We've attended fundraisers uh, at Porkfest. I had a jar that was set up by James Cleveland as a Free Rich Paul uh, fund. And pretty much when anyone tried to tip me, I said, if you're going to tip me, please put that in the uh, Free Rich Paul fund. So I've been able to get his story out to everybody. I've gotten a lot of new supporters, got a, um, lots of fundraising for it. So that's one of the big events that's been going on outside of Porkfest. And actually, he has another trial um, tomorrow, so that's what I'll be going to tomorrow as well. Wow, you have become you have become quite the activist since you've moved to New Hampshire. <laughs> I try not, you know, it's um, I'm not, you know, you know, not trying to be ashamed of it. I mean, unfortunately, the FSP, um, the Free State Project, Robin Hooders, Free Staters, um, sometimes it can really cause kind of controversy. Some people are very against it. Some people are very supportive of it. So I try not to, you know, be, t- I, you know, I'm definitely not ashamed of it. I just try not to. Um, be upfront about it unless you know someone obviously asks uh actually today when i went to go get lunch there was a car that was parked next to me that had no time left on its meter so i actually had an extra robin hood card because I, I had been saved by the robin hooders a couple times when my meter ran out um we put a quarter in the meter and gave them the card so it was really cool to be even though we're not technically part of robin hood um we you know wanted to obviously of course save them from the parking ticket so that was really cool that was something really small that felt really good to be part of which we shouldn't have parking tickets anyway so i i applaud right. you well, that's neat. Yeah, you know, I had the thing about the Robin Hooders is that it's been featured in the New York Times and a bunch of other newspapers about it. So word is getting out, and it was neat to be a, a part of that. I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're fine. You're fine. We are no problems there. None at all. Um, awesome. I don't, I don't understand what the big deal is. I mean, I know they're losing out on money because somebody might have parked too long, but, you know, you never know the circumstances to why somebody had to dump their car for a little while in the parking spot. And just the fact that they couldn't get out on time, it, it should be no reason for them to to have a ticket. So, you know, again, I applaud the efforts that you guys are doing. It's little, but it's big at the same time. It's it's really huge. And last year, when Robin Hood was being sued um, by the city of Keene uh, because they were claiming they were harassing their parking meters, their parking meter uh, officials, 
they actually said, okay, well, can you please give us a route of where your um, where your parking maids are just so that we don't have to ever have to cross paths them. We'll go the opposite way, but, you know, we have no idea where they're going to be going. All we're doing is that we're watching the meters. We're not paying attention to the cars that are there. We're not paying attention necessarily to the, you know, the parking officials that are enforced with that. So they asked us, they said, hey, we're not trying to harass them. We're not trying to, you know, run them out, but, you know, if you can provide us – a map of the route where they go so that we don't have to, you know, we can avoid them. And the city absolutely refused to do it. So that just tells you that they don't care about the, even their own workers. They care about the money. So they're refusing to comply with that. Okay, so Keene, New Hampshire is the hub of the Free State Project, correct? I would not necessarily say it's the hub. Activists live um, or, you know, Free Staters live in several different cities. Um, the main cities which tend to get the most um, draw from the free, for the free staters, either in media or people thinking of moving, um, is either Keene or Manchester. Manchester is not the capital. It is the largest city. Uh, for people that come from a big city, that's probably the closest thing that they um, can look to. It's about... I want to say a little less than 200,000, I think, in the metro area. Uh, Manchester is about half an hour outside Nashville, which is also um, a larger city. It's not nearly – I think it's about maybe half the size of Manchester. But those were all of the – you know, the big centers, like, you know, you've got, like, malls, you've got shopping, you have um, huge headquarters everywhere. Keene is a college town. Um, It's home to Keene State College. Uh, it's about 25,000, so you're going to find a lot of college students, a lot of retirees here, um, a cute little downtown. Keen for what it is, it basically has everything that you need. I mean, we've got, I mean, we've got like a Walmart, we've got Target, we've got, um, we actually now have an Ulta, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it doesn't, re- it doesn't offer everything that a big city needs. But for those that still want everything in a town, but doesn't want the hubbub of a uh, giant city, Keen is where to go. But you know, sometimes, sometimes activists will go and live. You know, I know there are some people that live in uh, Lebanon, which is up towards the north. Uh, we've got some people that live in Concord, which is the capital. But typically, um, most the majority of free staters I find live either in Keene or Manchester. Okay, yeah. How accepting and friendly are the people in these cities to the people who move? expressly for the Free State Project? Um, let's see. I'd say it's, it's hard to try it's, it's hard to try and calculate it right now since I've been uh, I've only been here a short while. Um, I know there are a couple of uh, businesses uh, that have expressly openly expressed that they appreciate the Free State they appreciate Robin Hood um, and especially for the work that they do and saving people tickets. Uh, one of those business, businesses I know off the top of my hand is Local Burger. Uh, Local Burger has a place in Keene as well, in, as well as in Boston, or it's either Boston or Amherst, I'm not sure. But they have openly um, been very supportive of Robin Hood and Free Staters. There is a place here also called Fritz, and they, uh, they, they, uh, it's a restaurant, and their claim to fame is their Belgian fries, which I've had, and they're pretty fantastic. But they serve like fries, sandwiches, paninis, uh, salads, and that kind of thing. Um, they have said that they do not wish to associate with free staters. They say that free staters aren't welcome. Like they 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 don't say that. They they say free staters are welcome. You know we you know are not saying you can't uh, sit down in a restaurant. They just don't want to be associated with either side. They don't want to be associated with any political side, Republican, Democratic, free state, no matter what. And you know that's kind of. You know, all right, you know, you're taking kind of a neutral stance where you're not refusing business, but you just don't want to associate with either side. So that's one that I would say is not necessarily um, open and accepting, just, you know, we don't want to be associated with it. Okay, and just for anybody who's listening who's absolutely confused right now to what the Free State Project is, why don't you explain the background of the Free State Project? Sure. The Free State Project is a movement to get um, 20,000 liberty-minded individuals uh, to move to New Hampshire to incorporate change and live within a limited to no government society in the state. Uh, New Hampshire itself is already one of the freer parts of the United States, and since it's re- uh, relatively small in comparison to most other states, it's the perfect size to try and capture that and just show really 
how liberty can work and how we can change, uh, how we can change, make change within the system starting in New Hampshire. That's very exciting to me, especially as someone who has just officially joined the movement like two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago maybe now. Um, I was having a discussion with my friend on Facebook, and she actually threw something out there. She's a diehard Republican, um, but she's pretty cool. She's open to my ideas, and i got to say that on a political spectrum, even though what we do is very peaceful and what we believe is very peaceful – our ideas are more are really more radical than the ideas from the Republicans and Democrats and the so-called two-party paradigm. Um, but if we can get people on board, it, it can be done successfully, but we just have to keep spreading the message. But my friend made a comment on her Facebook page about how if the Republicans are going to get anything accomplished in the House, then – 22 Democrats are going to have to flip sides and go vote with the Republicans. And I just read her status and rolled my eyes because it doesn't matter. It seems like no matter how many times I talk to her that she is never going to get it. You know, she's never going to change her mind. She is never going to, um, she's never, she's never going to listen and, and understand that she's fighting for nothing. So I told her, I said, why even worry about those 22? Let's just get rid of all of them. They're all bad. And she liked the comment, but then I had some Republican friend of hers say, really, well, what do you believe? If they're all evil, what do you believe? And I said, why don't we just rule ourselves? Why don't we just worry about our own lives? Why don't we just do our own thing? And she was like, well, how do you propose we do that? And I told her, I was like, either limit government to a very, very small fraction of what it is now or get rid of it altogether. And she's like, well, how do you propose we do that? So I told her, and she goes, oh, so in other words, you're one of those people who doesn't be active and doesn't do anything. You just run your mouth all the time. And I got so irritated with this woman. Oh, wow. You know, I am not, first of all, you know me well enough. I don't get irritated very easily. But second of all, the whole reason that I got involved and joined this movement is because I have been in the Republican Party. I did my, and it's it's worthless. My time's not worthless, but being a part of the party is worthless. They're accomplishing nothing. I mean, the Republican Party's got so much infighting going on right now that they don't even know who to trust. You know, we have Rand Paul, who's supposedly running for office, but anybody who trusts that man thoroughly confuses me because he's nothing like his father, who we were all fighting for, you know, in 2008, 2012. So I don't think the establishment is buying what Rand Paul is trying to push, and I don't even think the establishment knows what they want because they can't get their acts together. So I told this lady, I was like, not involved? I said, let's see. I'm the secretary of my local party. I'm on Congressional District 13's executive board for the state of Georgia. I said, I worked on a number of campaigns. I passed out literature across the state. Do you want to tell me now that I'm not involved? Maybe retract your statement? And then she totally avoided the question, the original question. And oh my after gosh. that, I was, I was like, wow. So apparently, unless you're actively physically doing work, educating people and spreading ideas is nothing. Wow, good for you. Yeah, I, that um <laughs> I can't believe she would say that. I mean, if she even knows you remotely as well as I did and just, you know, you're not the kind of person to just run your mouth. I mean, you know what you're talking about. So that's just that was completely rude, completely uncalled for. Yeah, I tried to post a link to the non-aggression principle, and that's when she was like, "Oh, so basically you do nothing." And I'm one of the fortunate ones who can say, no, I tried it. It didn't work. It's still not working. We need to go to something new now. So that, that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun fighting with uh, the Republicans on Facebook. Uh, yeah, I do you know remind... what? I... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. It's fine. Okay, well, I was just going to say, you know, sometimes it can be really difficult trying to persuade the Republican or even the you know, Democrats just say, you know, hey, you know what? 
your way of political lying is is false, and this is why. This is the whole reality of it. And I find that Republicans just tend, you know, not, you know I'm not trying to stereotype anyone, not trying to loop everyone into a collective system or anything, but I find that Republicans tend to be um, the most stubborn and the hardest to convince that and understand that the way to it is, you know, voluntarism. Uh, libertarianism and you know I just I, I'm sorry that you had to go through that because it just sounds as that she you know she was one of those Republicans it is true and there's another guy who broadcast on Freedomizer Radio his name is Eric Bell and Eric and I actually were part of, we are part of the Georgia Liberty Movement and he lives in South Georgia and I live more towards Northern Georgia but we were talking last night he called in on the air and I was like, yeah, you know, my former beliefs versus what I believe now. And he said, well, if you don't mind me asking, what do you believe now? Because the whole thing in Georgia that we were trying to do is the Georgia Liberty Movement, after Ron Paul didn't win, we decided to try to take over the Republican Party, like Ron Paul encouraged us to do. But any foothold that we gained back in the two, 2012 elections with the state house, we lost our foothold. The establishment doesn't give up their power easily. So they got it back. And in my opinion, we don't have another two years to try to get our people back into the office. We just don't. No. Uh, we have better things we have to do. So um, Eric, he asked me, he said, so what are your views? And I told him, you know, voluntarist and uh, anarchist. And he's like, I thought I was the only one on the network. That's cool. And I said, no, my co-host, John Moreland, he, is, he also believes the same way. Um, so he added me in a group today called Georgia, Georgians for a Stateless Society. So awesome. uh, I thought that was really cool. I didn't even know the group existed. It's an open group. So I'll probably look into that a little bit more and, and find out. And like I stated earlier, it's, it's kind of a radical thought just because we have been force-fed to believe that we need government, that the government is protecting us, that they run our lives. Um, the people out there who don't want to take responsibility for themselves and they want other people to take care of them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So it is more of a radical thought, like I said, what we believe. But when it comes down to it, if we can put it into action and get it to work, it, it'll be, it'll work out. I agree, and that's what volunteering is, is that people are voluntarily making associations, taking on tasks, and, you know, it just it kind of brings to mind the, the argument, well, who will build the roads if there's no government? It's such a stupid argument. Like, it should not even be an argument anymore. It's just kind of like, okay, well, the same companies that do make the roads, but without government intervention, and they would probably be even better. Probably so. Probably so. I do want to remind everybody that we do have a call-in number. It's 347-324-3704. And we also have a chat room at freedomizerradio.com. Create a name. Come join us. Come talk. Share ideas. Whatever. We're all we're both willing to talk to you. Um, also, too, if you missed tonight's broadcast, you can get out tomorrow at Voluntary Virtues Network uh, on the YouTube network. And we're going to go to a commercial, but when we get back, we will be talking more about this and other subjects. So we'll be back right after these messages. Bye. You know the Constitution like the back of your hand. You've read books, listened to podcasts, attended lectures, surfed websites, and watched videos. You've made liberty your life's goal, but something seems to be missing. Stickers from LibertyStickers.com. Exercise your freedom of speech with the world's most dangerous bumper stickers. That's LibertyStickers.com. But wait, there's more. You can buy Liberty Stickers wholesale. Get them for 99 cents each when you put 100 or more in your shopping cart in any combination. Sell them or give them away. They're great for gun shows, flea markets, fairs, outreach, and more. Earn extra money, promote freedom, and spread the word. Need custom stickers, labels, or decals for your organization or business? Liberty Stickers makes them. Go to LibertyStickers.com to order or call 877-873-9626. LibertyStickers.com, the world's most dangerous stickers. Thank you for tuning in to Freedomizer Radio, where we have a 24-7 chat room where you can come and share what's going on in the world with people of like mind. Anything and everything against the New World Order. 
Dial 347-324-3704 to catch our live show. Beginning at 9 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, Monday through Friday till midnight, and 9 to 9 on Saturday and Sunday. Take us to the beach. Take us to the park. Take us on a walk with the dog. Only on Freedomizer Radio. Hello, everyone. Proof is here. I want to let you know about our latest promotion on our FreedomizerRadio.com website. Our chat client, Bark, B-A-R-C dot com, is hosting a micro-Bitcoin giveaway while supplies last. All you have to do is go to FreedomizerRadio.com, join our chat room, create a screen name, and type to your friends. And some micro-Bitcoins will fall from the sky. Not only that, the more people that are typing, there will be some random lotteries as well. So just for typing to your friends, you can earn some micro-Bitcoins. So who knows how long this will last, but join us now, freedomizerradio.com. and I'm with GMO Free Vegas. So what are we going to do about this now? Well, to begin with, we advocate the labeling of genetically engineered food or foods with GMOs. Regardless of how you feel about the GMO issue, we can agree that we should at least have a choice of being informed about what we put into our bodies. We won't have a choice until these foods are properly labeled. We must remember who we are fighting in this battle. We are fighting corporations selling us poison, backed by corporations making us poison. And these corporations will only respond to one kind of vote, the vote that we make with our dollars. Recently, YoPlay faced so much criticism over high fructose corn syrup that they removed it from all of their yogurts. Right before and after the march against Monsanto in May, we saw major corporations like Whole Foods, Target, and Chipotle make major announcements about deciding to label and or phase out GMOs. This is happening because of us, because we will solve this as making demands as consumers first. Starting right now, we're going to boycott corn. This is all you have to do, is don't buy corn. Corn on the cob, corn in a can, corn in a mix at a restaurant, any visible kernels of corn. All we are asking for people to do right now is to boycott corn. This is going to be a clear, completely simple message that will definitely get back to its makers. We won't stand for poison. We won't stand for cronyism, and that is why we march against Monsanto. And we are back. That was a lovely commercial about corn. Yes, you heard that too. We saw boycott boycott corn, she says, because of the GMOs. Well, I actually uh I actually don't care for corn, so I would not mind it. Although I know we use corn for lots of other things and corn can also be used for livestock feedings, but I do not care for corn, so I would be okay with corn not being existent anymore. I'm not a big corn fan either, and you know what? It's not even it's not even one of the healthier vegetables. It's a it's carb loaded is what it is. And I'm not a big corn fan. And as for um, feeding it to livestock or feeding it to animals, it's not even good for animals. They use it as filler in a lot of dry cat and dog food. And according to my cat's vet, that could cause your pets to have diabetes. Oh, I agree. Like, it should not be used in anything, not even pet food. Like, I've become so picky about the pet food because I, you know, I love my cat and I want her to live a long life. So I specifically pick out the cat foods and try and pay top dollar for the ones that do not have any sort of corn or anything listed first. I make sure it has actual, like, real meat. So, I mean, figuratively, I have no idea, like, where corn should be used. I mean, (laughs) is that... It's actually funny because everyone, everyone, including my family and friends, tease me for not liking corn. And my mom is from this place where all I grow is corn. So it's just like, uh, I can't escape it. I do not like corn. Corn is evil. <laughs> Sometimes every once in a while I'll eat corn on the cob, but I have to cut it off the cob before I eat it. And um, if it comes out of a can or it's just the kernel, unless they're popped, forget it. I won't eat corn. Yuck. Yuck. Ew. What's the ooh for? 
Uh, corn on the cob, like all corn of any kind is nasty. Sorry. <laughs> I feel the same way about onions. I hate onions. They're awful. See, I don't mind onions that are like car- like caramelized or cooked and stuff and put on like top of burgers or anything like that. That's good. But raw onions are kind of like, ooh. I agree. I can eat car- caramelized onions or the onions that have been soaking in a pot roast for like hours. It's it's still got the flavor, but it's not crunchy. I think it's the crunchy, um, burning texture of fresh raw onions that just makes me gag. It's nasty. Oh God, that's disgusting. <laughs> yes. And uh, before we went to break, I was talking about how you can catch our show on Thursdays on the Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube. Now, anybody who doesn't know what the Voluntary Virtues Network is, uh, basically a bunch of like-minded broadcasts from other people who are voluntarists or anarchists, and you can go and you can listen to a variety of different shows, um, some of them from top names like Adam Kokesh, Walter Block, uh, Stephen Molyneux, just a bunch of different people with a lot of different messages who represent uh, the libertarian side of things. And I came across this article, and I actually ran it across uh, ran it across the guy who is in charge of the Voluntary Virtues Network about YouTube. And so apparently, YouTube, which anybody who knows, Google bought out YouTube a while ago, and they have given the power to 200 people and organizations, the ability to flag YouTube videos to be reviewed for having violated the site's guidelines. Now, people might say, okay, so this means that anything that's inappropriate is they're going through and they're looking and they're flagging. But we have to determine really what's inappropriate here because what they seem to be doing is they seem to be flagging activist accounts and they're shutting them down and not giving them any reason for it. Uh, are you familiar with Mark Dice? Um, that sounds familiar. This is the man who goes around interviewing people, like Americans in particular, and asking them questions that they should know as an American, and they come up with the most asinine answers most of the time, if they answer the question at all. Um, he is he's a political activist. And his channel was shut down recently. I've enjoyed watching his videos. Do you, have you ever seen, I, I think it's, it was called Jaywalking, and it was on the Tonight Show when Jay Leno was there, how he would go out and he would interview people on the street and ask them questions. And it was comedic because most of the time they couldn't answer the question and they looked foolish on camera. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. Mark Dice does the same thing, but he'll ask questions like there was one about July 4th, and basically he was alluding to the fact that, you know, we were liberated from England years ago during the Revolutionary War. These people could not answer the question. Some of them said we were still owned by England. It's a sad, sad affair and commentary on our society, but these are the kinds of videos that he would post, and this is, he was one of the first targets and had his channel shut down with no explanation. He said, YouTube did not even email me telling me my channel was shut down. And since I can't even log into the channel, I currently can't dispute this, he wrote online. So he had over 800 videos, 265,000 subscribers, and over 55 million views, with about 3 to 5 million views coming every month. Uh, He's well known for his various YouTube videos discussing conspiracies, politics, celebrities, petitions, and more. It says, among those who have been tasked with the new YouTube flagger authority is the UK Metropolitan Police's Counterterrorism Internet Referral Unit, which has been using its authority to seek reviews and removal of videos that it considers extremist. Government agencies and police departments are now more capable than ever of censoring videos that they don't like or that they find offensive. I am concerned with this article because of the fact that when you have a network like the Voluntarious Virtues Network, we are all activists and we're all spreading a very specific message. So I made this article 
available to the guy who started up the Voluntary Virtues Network, and I haven't heard anything from him yet, but I would hope that I opened up his eyes and he's keeping an eye on that. Uh, But I would like to know really how if YouTube is giving power to a UK um, association, that how is that how is that possible? I mean, why are they policing videos and activists from the United States? Well, you know, they that's a very good question because not only should they not have any sort of sovereign power over the United States because whatever um is uploaded in the United States is protected by the United States. I know we're all trying to be anti-government here, but the cur- you know current existing laws um, I mean, that's probably not going to last for very long. I can just immediately see some sort of retaliation just say, hey, we have freedom of speech here. They, you know, this is okay if they, can, this is okay if they have it here. I, you know, let's, let's think of, um, what's an example? Uh, Egypt, for example. Uh, a couple, of, a few years ago, um, there was, the, there was a crisis in Egypt and internet was shut down, I believe, for a day or two. Uh, in Egypt, and eventually it was brought back on because Egypt could not keep its people under control. People were still finding ways to get their messages out. So I'm willing to bet that this is going to, at some point, come to a halting, screeching stop because that's violating our freedom of speech. We as activists are allowed to videotape and put up our videos of what we want to talk about. I mean, let's look at Chris Cantwell, for example. Chris Cantwell has filmed himself shooting an American flag and then later setting it on fire. And it's just it's going to be amusing if they try and shut that down. In fact, an anti um free Keen movement here in Keene um did try to uh prosecute another uh free keener to take down a video where he filmed this man shooting himself and committing suicide and they said that it was violating the terms and services, that they can't have it on there. And both YouTube and Facebook came back and said, this does not violate anything whatsoever. He can keep it up. So I'm willing to bet that that, you know, that's horrible that they're trying to exercise those laws, but I can just, I you know, hopefully that should not last very long. Hopefully not. It says, now, looking at the date of this article, this was back in March, um, but, I mean, I think this is an ongoing Thing. So I think it is. I think it's relevant. Um, it says that because of public pressure, Mark Dice did have his site restored, and his backup first, and then his main channel listed under his formal name. But this is still a growing problem. If he didn't have such a fan base that stuck up for him, he might not have gotten his stations back. But YouTube yeah, absolutely. was, yeah, and YouTube was originally created for the purpose of people uploading themselves. I mean, it made waves when we were taking um, our broadcasting classes, my friends and I were taking our broadcasting classes, it was a new, it was a new form of medium. You know, people could become a star overnight. We saw this with the likes of Justin Bieber, who might not be talented whatsoever, but he, we can't dispute the fact he's a star. And other people have gotten their start on YouTube the same way. So, I talked to John a few weeks ago, and we were on the air. We also talked about how YouTube is going to be switching over to a pay-for-music service. They're going to compete with Amazon Prime. They're going to compete with Spotify. They're going to compete with iTunes and so forth. So people will have to pay to watch videos, and they'll be able to download them, but they they will still have to pay for it. So we're seeing a lot of changes in YouTube, and I think that the censorship issue is just going to become increasingly worse. Yeah, you, know, you you do bring up a good point that there is going to be a number of um, attempts of censorship with that. Um, we you know we can only hope that people are willing to speak up for themselves or, or that they call out to the people that are loyal to them and say this is not right. You know, please support me in standing up to this kind of censorship. This is this is not correct. Um, you know, people did that in the you know occupy. Occupy Wall Street movements where people were refusing to be silent because they wanted their voices heard. They wanted it to be restored. And, you know, while it it seems like that may or may not have made any changes, um, you know, I'm willing to bet that, I mean, you know, you brought up Justin Bieber. So, you know, let's look at Justin Bieber. When Justin Bieber is arrested or put under scrutiny for anything, how many of his friends interject and protest? I mean, the power of people um, in groups is 
you know, is a very powerful thing. You just like here in the liberty movement, if someone, you know, is being pressurized or being under any sort of force, they're going to have, you know, hopefully there will be people there to put up a resistance and let them know that this isn't right, this is not what we're going to stand up for. I know I would. I, w- I think I I would as well. I mean, if they're actually doing something wrong, if they're putting something up that is going to create great harm to society, that's one thing because we never want harm to come to society. So if it's something that could harm somebody, you know, by all means, review it. Review it all day long and see at the end of the day if bloodshed is going to happen because of something. But otherwise... That's because people want to share their ideas, and if the ideas are not dangerous ideas, just leave them alone. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the nice thing about here in New Hampshire is that even though there may be some people that are not necessarily free state friendly, um, the motto of the state itself is live free or die. Like the majority of people here do have a live and let live. Um, Most people aren't really going to be into your business so much. So, um I you know really hope that in a way that that would be able to be cascaded down as a whole in society is that you know hey you know no victim no crime if someone's not if someone's not bothering you if someone's not imposing your way of living then don't you know don't stick your nose in their business don't get yourself caught up in that that that's you know that's not your life let them go about their business. Now speaking of people who are famous who should not be. I oh, came across an article this past week about Kanye West. I don't know about you. I am not a Kanye West fan. No, just no. <laughs> yeah, and you know he has said many, many asinine statements in his career. His wife is Kim Kardashian, who is famous for being famous, I guess. Her family, I mean, she comes from, uh, her her stepdad is Bruce Jenner. He was an Olympian. But besides that, they're famous for being debutantes. That's about well, it. her um, her biological father is Robert Kardashian, who was the um, defense lawyer for O.J. Simpson. I mean, I think that that's, um, but then again, that's not necessarily her, her fame for, I mean, he was famous for that, and I really don't think that, um, uh, anyway, you know, he was famous in his own right for defending O.J. Simpson, but, you know, she, do, she does have kind of a famous family name. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know of the Cardassians, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Which we're going we're gonna to get into the geekdom of Danica here in just a few minutes, but oh, I want to talk about the... Uh, the idiocy of Kanye, who has compared having his picture taken to being raped. Okay. What? Rape rape is not a a funny subject. I'm not laughing, please. I'm not laughing because I think rape is funny. I'm laughing because this man is a raging fool. He says that having his picture taken is rape. It's rape. So he says that First of all, they they called him deluded, which is, that's apropos, it's hilarious. Um, He said, everybody needs a day off. Everybody needs the right to say, hey, you know what, I need a minute to breathe. I want to bring my family to the movies without 30 mother effing following me. Everybody here, they like sex, right? Sex is great when you and your partner be like, hey, this is what we both want to do. But if one of those people don't want to do that, what does that constitute? That's called rape. That is called violation. So, having your picture taken by paparazzi when you don't want to have your picture taken is rape. You know, I um, that's that's funny. I mean, Kanye West. I've got my own personal opinions about Kanye West. Uh, You know, I don't particularly care for the gentleman. Um, I don't just. I don't really like his music. I don't like him as an individual. Um, I can understand that. You know. Him being a semi-famous person and getting his picture taken all the time has got to be exhausting. I know I wouldn't like it very much either. I know I get kind of a little weirded out when I get a picture taken. But here's something that you have to understand when you go into a, when you go into a public place. Um, you're gonna you're gonna get photographed. You should have no you you know you have to understand you have no real vision of privacy. If you want privacy, 
go into um, private property, such as, you know, maybe like a movie theater, go into a, you know, restaurant. Restaurant can be considered private property. Go into your own house. And, you know, if you're being filmed while you're in your own house, then there's grounds for saying, hey, that's not right. You're violating my sense privacy. And as we all know, rape um, basically means, you know, something that you don't consent to. If you don't consent to being photographed in your own house, by all means. But when you're out in public, you know, again, you don't have any real sense of privacy. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because, again, you know, I'm not trying to bring up all this whole free keen and stop free keen stuff. But a bunch of people have been yelling at activists saying, hey, you can't film me. That's illegal. And she's like, well, actually, no, it's not illegal because we're in a public place. I am able to – if you had a camera, you are also perfectly legal to film me. Now, if I went into someone's house and started videotaping, then that's something different because New Hampshire also has a a dual-party consent where – you have to let them know that you are recording this, and they have, you know, they have to say no, I don't consent. And then you have, you, by a law, you have to stop recording. But in a public place, there's no, there's no such thing. So people are yelling, oh, get that camera out of my face, stop recording me. It's like, no, I have the right to record you. You're in a public place. Some of the stop for cameras have even been wearing shirts saying, please don't record me or don't record me. It's just like, okay, well, you know, sorry, you know, video quarters. You have only the only thing you have to fear is if you're doing something wrong. If you're not doing something wrong, then you then you don't have anything to worry about. But video recorders hold a, hold people accountable, which is why they're saying that you should record you know cops for what they're doing to hold them accountable. So I'm sorry, Kanye West, but if you're going to be out in a public place and you get photographed, well, tough beans. I mean, don't you know? I mean, don't be a target paparazzi target if you. Don't want to be photographed. Stay, you know, stay at your home. Go to a private place with security. Go into a movie theater and watch a movie. But you know, out in public, you shouldn't have any expectancy of privacy. That's just it's no. Well, you think too that with all the money they have combined, that if they wanted to watch a movie like a, a brand new movie that's coming out, uh, that you could probably pull some strings and have a preview in your own home. Or you could even, like, rent out the movie theater for one day. All of this is true. And Kanye, to me, is one of those people that, uh, what was the saying? And I think it was Mark Twain. Better to be thought an idiot than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Right. He's just one of those people. And I just, I can't stand this man. And I don't know what Kim sees in him. But please, you named your daughter Northwest. Yeah, you know, let's look at Gwen. You know, if we're on the subject of baby names, I mean, look at Gwen Paltrow's kids named Apple. Like, okay, you know, points for being original, but uh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, this is this is what our society has come to. This is sad, and I think I think you're exactly right. If you, uh, you know, it's kind of like living in a voluntary society. If you're going to volunteer to be famous and you're going to volunteer to have a life like that then you sign the contract into the fact that you're going to have your picture taken. Right. So I know what you're talking about. I saw a video from Keen where a guy's car was being towed, and they were filming the tow guy taking this car. And I guess he felt like he was being made a bad guy or a criminal on camera because he started cursing. And the person taking the film was like, man, we're not doing anything wrong. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep filming. And he just, he cursed at him. He was sticking up his middle finger. So I I think that's the same thing that you were talking about. But if you're in public, you know, there's a general expectation that you could be on film, especially if you're famous. And in Georgia, there's actually, a, it's a one-party consent. So if I was on the phone with you, you didn't know I was recording the call, but I knew that I was recording the call, then that's legal in Georgia. Wow, okay. So as long as you're aware of the fact that as long as one person is aware of it, it's not bad. Interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, I think that's to protect anybody externally from recording the call. So like somebody who might be bugging a call between two people and the two people weren't aware that they were being listened to on the phone. Yeah, so um, I actually had somebody on the phone one time call me and say, uh, you know, I told them, oh, I'm recording this phone call. And they were like, you can't do that. You better review your state's laws. 
I was like, I know my state's laws. I don't know what state you're in, but in my state, it's a one-party consent, and I've already informed you that I'm recording this phone call. So, hey, guess what? I'm doing nothing wrong. And she hung up, but that's the way it rolls. But oh, my goodness. That's of, absolutely hilarious. Yeah. We know our laws better than the people telling us to learn our laws. But uh, speaking of, again, famous rappers and the government, um, it has been made public recently that the CIA does not know where Tupac is hiding. <laughs> what? Uh, this is an this article came out yesterday, July eighth, that the CIA does not know where Tupac is hiding. They're clueless. They don't know where he is. Why is this news? The uh, the same reason why people still keep talking about Princess Diana years later. I guess so, uh, because. My sister-in-law posted this article, and it says the CIA have claimed they don't know where Tupac is during a lighthearted Q&A with their Twitter followers. I didn't even read the article right after she posted it. I was just confused, first of all. There are those conspiracies out there that say he's alive somewhere. And I must say, for a dead guy, he has more new hits coming out than people who are still alive. But... Her big question was, why does the CIA have a Twitter account? Why does the CIA have a Twitter account? Oh, well, I don't know. The CIA and NSA also have Facebook pages, which, speaking of which, Coplock is about to surpass them as far as likes are concerned on Facebook. So that should tell you something. It says, despite the rapper being killed in 2006, rumors about his death continue to circulate. The CIA did their part in putting an end to suggestions that the rapper may still be alive, tweeting, no, we don't know where Tupac is. So apparently it's very important, very important for people to know where Tupac is. Well, now that we know where Tupac is, let's try and find Aaliyah and Left Eye of TLC, too. Now, she's actually she's actually dead. I don't live far from where she's buried. And when she got killed, uh, I was working with a woman who had connections to the entertainment, agency, uh, the inter- entertainment agencies, and she said that she confirmed that those pictures were her. So no problems with that. But as for Aaliyah, But Tupac was uh, shot and killed, so I don't know why they're saying that he's still out there somewhere. Because he's, he's hanging out with Elvis. Come on. We all know this. Oh, okay. Because, you know, Tubox totally alive and one or another somewhere, but Aaliyah is definitely totally and con- and confirmed dead. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this. Um, I got a friend request acceptance today from Vermin Supreme. Oh, that's awesome. If you haven't re- if you haven't um watched the video about Dogecoin, he's actually on that video and it's hilarious cuz he's just like, "What the f is Bi- what the f is Dogecoin? You know, what the f are you talking about?" And it's hysterical. I met him back in 2012 down in Tampa at Paul Fest or whatever they called it down there. It was the festival for that they held for Ron Paul before the um Republican National Convention, but um, he was going around with a signature boot on his head and a megaphone in his hand. It was really awesome. Um, oh, that's so when hilarious. I saw him, when I saw him today, I was like, okay, I got to send him a friend request. And he, he, he actually, he, uh, he accepted it. So I thought that was cool. I love him. I know he was meandering around Porkfest. Did you see him at all at Porkfest? I did, and it was actually really funny because, um, you know, he always, you know, wears the boot on his head, and we were at Buzz's Big Gay Dance Party, and they pulled him onto the stage because he was in the running for best costume. And some people were like, ah, I can't believe a guy that wears a freaking boot on his head as a contestant. La, la, la. And I'm just kind of like, oh, you be quiet, all you haters. (laughs) He's definitely a charismatic character. Uh, We saw him... In a lot of clips, he was running for president and said that his big ticket was um, health care for your mouth. He's a big into toothbrushes, and he wants to give all Americans a pony. 
Oh yes, he is definitely my my partner in in brony crime. Oh, I lo- I love ponies. I I would just say that. <laughs> You do love ponies, and you know I've talked to some people who also love ponies, and I still have that song stuck in my head—the one you played for me, Pinkie Pie's song. Me? Oh man! Speaking of um, speaking of ponies, a friend of mine from Porkfest bought um, someone from Porkfest um, made little uh, My Little Pony figurines and made them into like a Liberty figures. Like basically, it was just it was it's just a figure of a pony, but it's spray painted black, and it's uh, the main and the tail have been completely redone in Liberty colors, like black and yellow for for um, anarchism, um, black and red for vol- you know volunteerism or anything like that. And so um, a friend of mine bought me one, and I was just like, oh, this is so cool! I have a Liberty pony. So you know, I have a, I. And she said, and it was really funny because the woman that sold it said that uh, that figure was originally Pinkie Pie, and I'm like, that is really, really funny because whenever my friends compare me to one of the ponies on the show, it's always Pinkie Pie because she's like really hyper and bubbly and happy, which is what apparently what I am. So that's really funny. Yeah, you had said that um, that reminded you of me because I always try to make people happy. You always do try to make people happy. You try to make them smile, and you try and say nice things. So it's like, this is Mandy's song. And it's the remix, which is even better. Yes, it's so darn catchy. And I played it for my friend's daughter, who's totally into ponies like you. And she was like, how do you know this song? How do you know (laughs) that you watch ponies? I'm like, I don't watch ponies. I was told that this is my song, so I listened to it. And she was just excited that somebody knew what it was because then I pulled out Bad Seed and she was just like, how do you know this song? I was like, why do I know these songs? I shouldn't know these it's songs. It's kind of like my friends are crazy about these things. Urgh. Oh, see, I love my friends because they're so wonderful. So it's it's really nice to have such a diverse group of friends. And people don't really pick on you about your love of ponies because that's how we roll. So I mean, they kind of do at first because they're just like ah da 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 it's a show for little kids. I'm like really okay, you know what? You know, go right ahead and you know watch one episode of it, just one episode of it, and tell me it's still a little show. It's still a show for little girls. Like I have gotten like about three or four different guys, grown up men by the way, to watch one episode and they can't stop watching. They actually enjoy it. And one of my friends actually, I had him watch it. And it was really funny because we were hanging out. This was like about last year or so. But um, we were hanging out, and I said, you should watch this. He's like, no, I don't want to get ridiculed. I'm like, just watch it and just, you know, tell me something. Just give it just give it a shot. It's like, okay, fine. So I watched the first episode, and then the second episode, and then the third episode. And before I know it, he's like halfway done through the season. He's just like, I can't stop watching. And I had like, I didn't, you know, keep in mind, I had fallen. I had passed out on the couch. I was like tired because I had been traveling all day. So I so I passed out about the time he starts the second episode, and I wake up, and he's like seven or eight episodes in, and he's just like, I can't stop watching. I'm like, I told you, and it was actually even <laughs> – oh, I know, and it was so funny because he and his sister share a Netflix account, and so she texts him like about an hour later, and she says, what's up with my little pony stuff? And he's just like, a friend was using my Netflix account. I'm like, oh, come on, man, man up, dude. <laughs> It's it's cool these days to watch ponies, friend. I mean, my my roommate is a brony. He has all the little figurines all over his room. Uh, That's what he grew up with. He said when he was little, he was devastated to find out that it was a girl show. But you know, these days it's it's cool to be a brony. So you know, you guys probably get along really well. But you know, it's it's absolutely hilarious because one of the things about My Little Pony that people. Um, such as myself, really enjoy is that the anime, I mean, well, first, this isn't, I mean, the first reason, and this isn't necessarily the reason why we like it, but um, the woman that animated Powerpuff Girls is the lead animator on this, um, Lauren Faust. And so, you know, that automatically um, makes people, like, so it's very whimsical, very fun. But one thing that's huge about My Little Pony, which draws so many fans, is all the different, like, pop culture and <laughs> nerd references they'll make. Like, one of the last episodes they made was a reference to Bioshock uh, Infinite because they had a birdcage and they had kind of steampunk Victorian clothing. Um, another one that they had a reference to is that they had a weird Al Yankovic pony in there. They had a um, 
What's not on the head? Oh, yeah. They had a Doctor Who reference because they had the 10th Doctor walking around. And Doctor Who has been kind of a recurring character in most of the Pony series. So people kind of always look for him and be like, oh, it's Doctor Who. And you know he's te- you know he's not formally named a Doctor Who's because there's a cop you know obviously there's a copyright legal thing there, um, but they call him Doctor Who's because he's got an hourglass figure and he's got spiky hair kind of like what David Tennant does. So there were two references <laughs> to Doctor Who. The first one is that Doctor Who's was one of the judges in the Olympic Games, and you know the first pony holds up an eight, the next one holds up a nine, and then he holds up a ten. You know it's ten for David Tennant who was the tenth Doctor. And so there's one you know there's one Doctor Who reference there. Another one is that do- is that Doctor Who's and this other girl pony who had a rose cutie mark, you know Doctor, you know the tenth Doctor and Rose from Doctor Who were strolling around the woods, which is also pays a homage to one of the episodes. So again, the My Little Pony is just laden with pop culture references as well as jokes that totally appeal to adults as well as kids, and it's absolutely hysterical. See, I love this because if I had John Moreland on, like. I usually do, he would not be down for talking about the ponies, and he would probably be upset saying this has no value whatsoever to spreading a message in society. So I love how we've hijacked the show, and we're going to talk about whatever we feel like talking about tonight. Yeah, we should totally talk about whatever we feel like, and you know, if I can go on again about my pony, because I just, you know, I love ponies, and not only did I watch like a little bit back in the '80s, but I just, I love what they've done the show. I love the updated feel to it, and I love how um, some of the jokes there are just so hysterical. Um, I'll give an example of one joke, and one joke is that the ponies go on a picnic to watch like the uh, shooting stars and such, and one of the um, one of the ponies has a dragon companion, and the dragon companion gets bored, wanders off and drinks all the <laughs> and drinks all the punch. And his name is Spike. And so he's laying there on the picnic table full of punch and the ponies come back and they say, Oh, where'd all the punch go? And then Pinkie Pie, the one that we've been talking about, says, Oh look, it looks like all the punch got spiked <laughs> You know, That's a joke that like totally yeah. flies over the head of kids, but adults are gonna be like, Whoa, they just put a alcoholic joke in the show. What? <laughs> Do you find a big difference between Pony Generation 2.0 and the original ponies? Oh yeah, there's de- there's definitely a a generation gap. Um just you know, not not only in the themes that go on. I mean, I you know, I can't really remember any of the main plots or anything of the original ponies, but you know, the original ponies w- you know was definitely very girly, definitely very um whimsical and cheesy. I mean, most 80s cartoons were. Let's be perfectly honest, you know, let's look at Thundercats and everything like that, uh, as far as cheesy goes, but, you know, the updated My Little Pony is just, you know, is it full of modern issues that a lot of people have, but each of the little ponies represents, like, a stage in a child's development. Like, you've got Rainbow Dash. Rainbow Dash is, you know, the sporty, tomboyish character, so she appeals to girls who are tomboys or boys that do like sports, like to get out there and rough and tough. You have Rarity, who is like the, um, you know, she's all into makeup and clothes. So you've you know, got girls who are like little fashionistas. They can relate to her. You've got Pinkie Pie, who loves throwing parties, and she's friendly and bubbly. And so, you you know, she can, um, you know, she can be relatable to people that are very, you know, upbeat and perky and love doing that things. And then you have Fluttershy, who is a very um, extremely shy pony that loves to be, around animals more than people and so people can uh relate to her if they're feeling shy. So you know, I I love the updated version where it's just it can people can relate to it in so many different ways. And I do want to remind everybody once again that if you have anything to comment about ponies or otherwise, you can call in at 347-324-3704. You can also join us at freedomizerradio.com in the chat room. Create a name, come in, share your thoughts. Right now I have Tessa in the chat room with me. She has her own show here on the network, um, and she's talking about some cartoons. I think some of them were not as popular when I was younger as others, but um, she's talking about Coyote and Roadrunner, which those are Looney Tunes, and she's talking about the Jetsons, and... I don't think those were as big when I was little. But then she mentioned He-Man, and he's making a comeback. But he was huge back in the '80s when. Oh, he we was. Were young. Yeah, he so, was huge. He was. So 
um, she's she's bringing up a lot. Now we do need to go to another commercial break, but I will say this: just because we're girls doesn't mean that we don't like to game. And we are going to talk all about our fiendish gaming ways when we come back after these commercials. Awesome. There are a lot of problems with Common Core. I don't even have time to go into most of them. But a step in the right direction would be to give local communities, teachers, parents control over their schools so they can design curriculums and standards to best meet the needs of their students and get the federal government out of education. Globe Sound and Consciousness Institute presents the Globe Sound Healing Conference with the full spectrum of the most well-known and respected pioneers, researchers, therapists, doctors, and musicians in the field. The conference will focus on acoustic instruments, sound and medicine, new sound technologies, sacred geometry, and raising consciousness with sound. The conference is being held September 26th to the 29th in the San Francisco Bay Area. Call 415-777-2486 or go to globesoundhealingconference.com. That's globesoundhealingconference.com. Come listen to Ancient of Days, where we talk about the lies, misrepresentations, and holes in the history we learned in school. Mondays, 3 p.m. Pacific Time, only on Freedomizer. Thank you. There is a new program on the Freedomizer Network. Bloody Beak Radio, punching the new world order in the nose. Bloody Beak Radio is here to inform you on a wide variety of topics revolving around current and recent events. The main thrust of the show is not just to inform you of the problems we face, but rather, how do we analyze them in a way that we can use to create counter-propaganda and use that knowledge in our everyday lives? In a sense, how do we market the truth? Bloody Beak Radio will give you the tools to win the information war so we can destroy the barriers that divide the people and have a peaceful revolution. Join your host, Kyle Baker, on Sunday evenings to have an honest discussion about how to win the numbers game and ensure that we decide the tempting point, not them. Are you dedicated to ending the new world order? Well, it's time to make way for spontaneous order. Hi, I'm Eric Bell, host of Freedomizer Radio's new hit show, For Whom the Bell Tolls, where you will hear current events from a volunteer's perspective, philosophical libertarianism, and a roadmap to a free and stateless society. Tune in every Tuesday at 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific and 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. Greetings, this is Blake the Eccentric, and I want to invite you to check out my show on Freedomizer Radio, The Eccentric Perspective, featuring outside-the-box politics, philosophy, and gonzo journalism. Let's begin. Let's begin. But be warned, with knowledge comes responsibility, and you might not see the world the same way again as I attempt to open your mind, speak to your common sense, and challenge your critical thinking skills. So please join me as I cover the latest news and current events Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday at noon Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern, only on Freedomizer Radio. And we're back. little commercial break there, promos for some of our other shows here on Freedomizer Radio. And again, if you missed tonight's show in its entirety or just partially, you can catch us tomorrow on the Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube. And again, there's a number of other shows. They're all liberty-minded, anarchist, voluntarist. We're all uniting to spread a common message. So check us out there tomorrow if you don't get to hear the show all in its entirety tonight. But tonight, John Moreland could not make it, so I have Danica Great on the air with me, and we're about to talk about hardcore gaming. We are two chicks who game. And being a chick in gaming 
is becoming increasingly more popular these days. Um, and as we've hijacked the show from what John Moreland and I usually talk about, we're going to talk tonight about gaming. So, Danica, you had some specific thoughts you wanted to share about the fact that we're both gamers. Woohoo! Gaming is so much awesome. That was <laughs> I know, it's really <laughs> cheesy in there. Um, yeah, you know, I just you know wanted to talk about um, just the different kinds of games that we're playing, um, different themes that we can find in these video games. Uh, one thing that I was noticing, and, and this is kind of cheesy, but on you know on a small two E grand scale, I think it could potentially work. Um, have you ever heard of the game called Animal Crossing? Um, I want to say yes, I have. Okay, um, I'll try and um, I'll, I'll try I'll try and explain a little bit. But it's a Nintendo game. Uh, the first one came out on the GameCube. Uh, the not the uh, not the last generation of consoles, but the one before that. Um, the the GameCube game was basically an Animal Crossing. You take on the role of a human, and it's very whimsical, very um, kid friendly game. But you take on the role of a human, and you go into a world where you know there's you know walking, talking animals. Hence the name Animal Crossing. And basically, um, it's like a Nintendo version of The Sims. You have neighbors, you get to know them, you can build a house, you can become the mayor of your town, you can send mail, uh, you can invite your friends on their other systems to come visit you, you can um, you know, plant trees, you can harvest, you can do activities, you can find fossils and donate to the museum, um, have different kinds of, you know, just kind of things that you would have in a small town. Um there's been different kinds of versions for different platforms. Like there's the original Animal Crossing for GameCube. Uh, there was uh, one for the DS, and the most recent one, which was released last summer for the 3DS, uh, is you know one of the top-rated games for the 3DS and one of the best games that Nintendo has 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 made, in my opinion. Where Similar to the other ones where you join a village, you become mayor of the village, you can build your own town, and so on and so forth. Does that sound familiar at all? Um, I think I've seen commercials. I saw pictures. Um, did you mention the Game Boy somewhere in there? Uh, well, the 3DS uh, is is a handheld, much like the Game Boy. Uh, Animal Crossing was not ever released for the Game Boy. It was released for the DS, which you, I guess, is an updated version of the Game Boy. I sometimes affectionately call my 3DS a Game Boy because I grew up on the Game Boy system, so that's sometimes it just kind of slips out and I call it that. But the first Animal Crossing started on the GameCube, and it's been released different pl- platforms since then. The 3DS, that's what you were talking about. I have seen it on yes. the 3DS. Now, um, Tessa is in the chat room. She's completely confused. She's like, a 3DS, what's that? Well, Tessa, if you know what a Game Boy is from the 80s and early 90s, it is the neighbor slash relative of the Game Boy. It's just like the latest handheld game system. And um, yeah, I, I mistakenly call it the Game Boy, but that's what I meant because I know I've seen it for the DS. So uh, yeah, and I have heard of it. And the reason why it's called the 3DS is that it's basically just like the DS. Um, the 3D comes in effect the LCD screen. It has two screens, one on the top, one on the bottom. So the top one, um, there is a 3D slider on the side and you can change it based on your preference of 3D. I rarely have the 3D on myself because after a while it just kind of makes um, my head hurt because it hurts my eyes. Um, but typically for different kinds of scenes, or different kinds of movements, I'll want to turn on the 3D just so I can see the grand scheme of things. But you know, that's the nice about the 3DS is that you can turn it off if you want to. So that's really the only difference. Also, there's better um, Internet capability and better infrared with the 3DS. That's been upgraded from the DS. Well, I will say I understand the whole giving headaches or whatever. I could never play the 64 because it gave me a headache from motion sickness. Yeah, um, I you know I'm also not necessarily a fan of the whole 3D thing. I rarely go see 3D movies because after a while it just kind of makes my head hurt. There's a couple movies that really are awesome for 3D, Avatar being one of them, because you actually feel like you're actually in the spaceship and whatnot. But I, you know, I don't have um, the 3D game on myself because it just makes my head hurt. But uh, where I was trying to go with Animal Crossing was that I 
felt that in a lot of ways our society could benefit from Animal Crossing because one of the things you can do in Animal Crossing is that being the mayor, you can uh, you can have drives to build uh, public projects such as like a bench, a fire hydrant, a fountain, um, a you know a street light, a um, a street clock, that kind of thing. And what's neat about this is that all these projects are accomplished through a series of donations. So, let's say you want to build a um, you want to build a fountain. Now you can build the fountain anywhere you want as long as obviously you have enough room. But basically you say, Okay, I want to build a fountain in front of this in front of the town square. Simple enough. So they set up a little like a, a a thing for you to donate your currency in. Now in Animal Crossing the currency is bells, but you know, we'll you know, let's just assume that it's just any currency that you want. But what's neat about Animal Crossing is that like I said, their town and their public words are all accomplished through donations. So you set the thing, you say, okay, we need, you know, 1,000 bells. To, uh, I'm sorry, 100,000 bells. 1,000 bells is not enough. But, you know, we need a, um, we need 100,000 bells to, to build this. So people come and they put in their money. And, you know, the different, the NPCs in the game, um, well donate as well so you accomplish this you accomplish the fountain by donating all these bells and once you achieve your goal it's built and what's neat about that is that the people that want this are volunteering to put in their money to build this public thing but people that don't want it don't have to put in their money and they're not they're not I mean, they maybe they're upset because they don't particularly want a fountain but they're just like you know what i don't really see the benefit of a fountain so i'm just not going to donate to it they're still, you know, they're not being taxed on it. They're not having their money stolen from them to build the fountain. And when the fountain is built, the people that did in fact donate to it can enjoy it. Huh. So I was just thinking, you know what? I I guess this is kind of a long shot, I guess. But anyone that's played these Animal Crossing games will, you know, appreciate that. But yeah, imagine if our society. Um, or even just some towns, even if we want to start small, f- ran on that. So let's say, you know, let's say we have a town that is that is funded completely by donations, by volunteer time, so people can come together and say, "Hey, we want a fountain in here," um, but you know, we don't want to we don't want to tax people because what if some people just don't want a fountain? They don't see any benefit to it. But the people that do want the fountain are willing to put their money forward to um to crowdsource and get the fountain built. And I think a lot of people that are that wouldn't think that would happen. I mean, let's look at some very successful projects on Kickstarter where people have an idea and they propose it and they're able to get it funded through donations of others that that want to have a piece of it. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know if it will ever work in this society or any society for that matter, but I was just thinking how how neat would it be that if we truly lived in a voluntary community where if people want something built, they would come together, pull their funds, and have it built. And that way, no one felt that they were having their money stolen for something that they did not necessarily support. But I love that example. That's that's so cool. And, you know, I was thinking earlier, I don't know why I was thinking this, but uh, you're starting to see these themes pop up in a lot of different media. And, for instance, I was thinking about it. Um, the Lego movie that came out, what, like last year, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I don't think that's a movie I'll ever see. I don't have a want to go see the Lego movie. I have not, I still have not seen it. But my mind has changed because those who have seen it said that it's a heavily libertarian minded themed movie. Yeah, I have um I've heard that it's a great movie. I've only seen little bits of bits and pieces of it. Um, but what I did see, I was laughing so hard because it's per- no not only does it have a lot of libertarian ideas in it but it's full <laughs> it's great for those that um like me can be a little um ADD because it's just like oh look over there oh what's going on over there oh over here over here over here and, like there's just so many different things that are going on and it's hysterical um, so that's good to know the the comedic value is very important and uh I don't know do you think that inserting this mindset and this frame of mind into 
movies and games and so forth. Do you think maybe this is the way of trying to get our point across, but doing it in a subtle way? Uh, you know what? It's planting the. You know, if we can plant the seeds of a voluntary society, of a libertarian society, you know, again, we're not. You know, um, liberals and conservatives have been doing that for for years too. Let's you know, let's for, look for example, Wall-E, um, that Pixar movie that has a little robot. I mean, you know, I love Pixar and Disney movies. I did, but I just I absolutely cannot stand this movie because. Of the stupid global warming, people are getting fat message. I mean, I'm, you know, I wonder if this film was completely funded by Al Gore because of just the upfront and the upfront and very obvious global warming conspiracy, fat people conspiracy, and just totally turned me off. It was just apparent and right in your face. With a libertarian message, very subtle, such as that that's being imposed in, Ca- in the Captain America movie, where you have these people thinking that. Where you're under all the surveillance, you're under all of this threat for protection. When in all reality, you're not. People are being thrown into a cage, and being brainwashed to think that that's okay when it's not okay. I think I like you said. You know, television and so forth are huge ways of of brainwashing the masses. I guess if you have to be brainwashed, then hearing a libertarian message would be acceptable to me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I and mean, get you know entertainment, I mean that's just that's where our society is, is that you know people love to be entertained. People want to have want to be able to escape the statism. They want to escape the you know, the drama of real life. But you know, by by planting these in movies and people that I mean that's how people get their ideas across. So it's just it's going to be something that we have to take to the media in a lot of ways to try and get our point across. Yes, and on a totally unrelated note, I I would like to address nine rappers who pretended to be rich but were actually flat broke. <laughs> Mandy, what is up with you and rappers today? I was just laughing my head off because I came across this article and I'm like, seriously? It just... What resonates in my mind and in my head is the funny part that uh, I have a lot of students, and uh, students have actually come out in the past straight out and said, well, when I grow up, I'm going to be a rapper. And I'm looking at this list, and I'm thinking, seriously? Really? I mean, listen to this list. Some of the major names in rap, Ludacris, in a custody battle with the mother of his child and revealed in court filings that he only earned $55,000 $55,000 over the previous year. Oh, man, 55000 please, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, little Bow Wow was in court after his Bentley was repossessed. He revealed that he had only $1,500 in his bank account. <laughs> uh, exhibit who is the former host of the MTV show Pimp My Ride, filed bankruptcy after owing over $1 million to the IRS. Jesus. Um, Method Man was arrested for failing to pay taxes back in 2011. Fat Joe went to prison after pleading guilty to tax evasion after owing over a million dollars to the IRS. Uh, Little Flip, who I don't know who Little Flip is, went to court and told the judge that he can't pay more than $500 per month in child support. That means he's earning about $3,000 per month. Uh, wow. Darwell went to prison for two years for tax evasion after owing millions to the IRS. Somebody named Beanie Siegel used to rap next to Jay-Z but went to prison for drug possession and also had serious trouble with the IRS. And Young Buck from G-Unit went bankrupt and lost his home, forcing him to sell his jewelry and everything else. And he said, it says, if you listen to any of his songs, you'll hear that he usually rapped about how much money he had and even made fun of other rappers who have gone broke. And so now maybe he'll start making jokes about himself. Okay, so while this list is hilarious to me because these are the people that my kids look up to, um, notice that most of these people got in trouble because they owed a lot of money to the IRS. Oh, gee, I wonder why that is. 
Well, and sadly to me, most of these people would not be in any monetary monetary trouble or legal trouble if we lived in the society that we want to create where we're not paying taxes. Well, and as we all know, taxes are theft. I mean, they're taking money to uh, support to support things that we're not even okay with that we don't wish to have any sort of funding for. You know, I want you know I want to help your you know I want to help your grandmother get the medicine care that she needs, but you know, don't hold a knife up to my throat and forcibly take it from my wages. Well, how many people would probably give a lot more money? and share with their fellow man, if you will, if they had it. And that's a, that's exactly my point, is that if we had, um, you know, if we had voluntary people uh, and no taxes, people would have a lot more flexible income, and we would be able to donate to the charities that we want. We'd be able to donate more to humane societies, to the United Way, um, to Habitat for Humanity, for UNICEF if we wanted to, but, you know, a lot of people aren't able to because they don't have any total income because their taxes are going to places that we're not even wanting to pay for, like the Bearcat, for example. Who wants to pay for the Bearcat? I still don't want to pay for the Bearcat. Well, at the same time, I mean, as a substitute teacher for the last six years, and we'll get into my job interviews here before the end of the show, um, I, I make a limited amount of money. Substitute teachers are very, very poorly paid for what they put up with. And I think that mostly people view substitute teachers as people who just come in and sit around and do nothing. But then there are a few of us, like me, who are certified teachers who are looking for full-time jobs, who cannot find full-time jobs, so they rely on substitute teaching. And so that's what I've been doing for the last six years. Um, but... When you're bringing in limited funds, as it is, they're taking, you know, a fraction of your paycheck and they're confiscating the money. You'll never see the money again. You don't have the money to be giving to other people, and there are other people who have it better off that, than you do who are using the system to their advantage, and they're better off than you. You know, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a horrible, twisted system, and... Um, it's like you said, taxation is, is theft. I understand about voluntarily giving, and people have misconceptions that in the voluntarist or anarchist movement, we're just going to be selfish with our money. There's not going to be charities. People are, are going to die homeless. They're not going to have food. No, there's charity. It's just we choose where our money goes, and people can't take advantage of the system. People, you know, it just—it's just—it's very sad that so many people don't understand it, and so many people are so willingly wanting to have taxes raised to fund, to you know, what's it go to fund? It goes to fund a war. It goes to fund militarization, uh, more cops, and you know, people. Just, what's really scary is that people don't understand it. No, they don't. And you know, when I brought up the the list of these rappers, and you're like, man, she's going off on another rant about rappers. Uh, I really don't feel sorry for these guys. I I don't feel sorry for them. It sounds like they are poor managers of their income. But most of them would not be in legal trouble if the IRS did not exist, if we weren't paying taxes. I mean, it's like you're saying you're not allowed to be successful without owing somebody. And that mindset carries over into other parts of life. I mean, in schools, there are some schools that say you can't give students zeros. It doesn't matter if they didn't do the work, and it doesn't matter if they didn't turn it in. You're not allowed to give students zeros. Well, the student doesn't care if they're earning a zero, so why should we not give them what they actually earned, which should be a zero? Now, these kids are going to leave these schools with the mindset that we owe them something. We owe them, whether the grade is a 50, whether the grade is a 10, we're sitting here essentially saying, you didn't earn this, but we're giving you a 50. And and again, it it reinforces the mindset for these kids that we're owed something. Yeah, I I totally agree that, 
you know, I, I don't agree that we shouldn't be giving kids zeros because we should be giving kids zeros. You know, if they're not doing the work, then they're not going to get any points for it. You know, and by the way, the whole rapper thing is that I was only making fun of you because that was that was the third time you had brought something up, and I was just thinking, wow, you just really have a vendetta against rappers today. So I was just I was only trying to, to make a joke. <laughs> I wasn't tired of um, it. It was it was humorous, but I was just I was making funny of that. I thought it was funny anyway because if I was on the show with John Moreland, he never would have allowed me to talk this much about rappers. But I mean, <laughs> we've we've linked it back. We've linked it back to everything that we stand for. You know, it just it just drove me crazy that I'm reading this this list of, of rappers and because the IRS says you owe us because you're famous and you haven't paid what you owe, you're you're going to be in legal trouble. If we were in medieval England and they weren't paying these taxes, they'd be thrown in the camp. Yep. So I that's just like I'm I'm just shocked. I mean of all the issues to have, at least it's not they're most of them aren't going around on drug related and gun related charges, which some of them are. Um but yeah, John John never would let me talk about numbers. I think he would hardly even find this article interesting, but I thought it was interesting, and you thought it was funny, so mission accomplished. All right. Well, you need to tell John that he needs to have, like, ponies on the show next time or or something easily hijackable. Yeah. Um, his dad listens to the show sometimes, from what I understand, and dad finds value with a lot of what we say. And basically, that probably would have been, like, that had absolutely no value whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> we don't care. We'll do what we want. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I do <laughs> have to say, I, I've been talking about uh, my interviews. Now, I had three job interviews this week alone. I had two yesterday, and I had one this morning. Um, for those who don't know, I am certified to teach multiple things. I can teach elementary school, which is pre-K through fifth grade in the state of Georgia, uh, I can teach middle grade language arts, which is fourth through eighth grade, and I can teach interrelated special ed, which is more of your students who um, maybe get small group instruction. A lot of them have learning disabilities. It's not your kids who need more constant attention because of low IQ issues. But I'm um, hoping something pans out. I mean, I've been looking for a job for two years now, and it seemed really good. So we'll see what happens. But I know that I've been keeping people updated with that situation, and uh, I really hope that something comes out of it. I know that you're kind of in the same boat. You're not looking for a teaching job, but you are looking for a job. Yes, I am, and I uh, I did want to ask you. So those three, were those three interviews were those for three separate jobs, or were those three like you know stage interviews to get a job that you were looking for? Oh, these were three different schools for three different positions in three different counties. Actually, um, one of them is the county oh, that I actually that I actually live in um, that I graduated from. I'm a product of the school district. Um, another one was a county south of Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta is in Fulton County, and I actually had an interview in Fulton County. But the thing about Atlanta and the thing about Fulton County is that Atlanta has its own school district. It's called Atlanta Public Schools. So there's Atlanta Public Schools inside Fulton County, and I actually had the interview in the Fulton County School District. So it is different. But Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've been driving all over the place the last few days. Like I said, I hope something pans out. The interview today seemed to go really well, and the principal, she even said, I'm very impressed with your experience. So hopefully that works in my favor, and hopefully this time next week I'll be getting ready to um, take on a new job. But I know this time next week I will be packing to take a trip and getting ready to go. I'll be going not this upcoming Friday, but the next Friday to – Idaho. I am very sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what you keep saying because you moved to New Hampshire from Idaho. I think that the biggest thing I'm going to have to get used to is the two hour time difference. Yeah, that that always that still kind of throws me for a loop because I'm here and you know, it's a quarter to nine. I'm thinking, oh, it's still a little early back home. I can still make a phone call and you know, still be okay, but. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and then it's just weird knowing that 
one thing that that kind of throws me off by being here on the East Coast is that um, not only does it typically get um, – is it, like, bright light out by 6 o'clock, um, it also gets really dark here very fast. Like, I'm used to back home it being still sunny out at 10 o'clock at night. But like, usually by about 10 o'clock at night, um, it's – you know, the sun's not out, but it's still bright out, and it's uh, – you know, and it, it started. You know, the sun's obviously starting to set, and it's starting to get darker. But it's still light enough that it's like, hey, I don't have to put the lights on my car yet. You know, here it's like it's like it's almost pitch black right now, and it's about a quarter to nine. So, definitely huge difference that it gets darker here, which is really weird. Like I can only imagine that in winter it's going to get pitch black out by probably like four o'clock, and that's going to make me super depressed. Well, the other thing too is that. New Hampshire is even further east than Georgia. So it's still fairly light outside right now here. And where you are, it is still darker because the sun is going to go down faster. Uh, Well, not faster, but, you know, it's going to go down first where you are because you're further east. So I can can understand that. And during the winter, it probably is going to be a weird experience. But the fact is that I'm assuming, I could be wrong about this, but... Isn't a New Hampshire winter comparable to what you dealt with in Idaho? Um, not really. Um, New Hampshire, New Hampshire is going to be about ten times worse because, um, you, well, there's there's just going to be way more snow. Like they just the climate here is different. Like where I lived back home, I lived in kind of a valley kind of area, so the mountains kind of took all the snow. We would get snow back home. But it would just kind of it would pile up. The roads would be absolute crap for about a day or so. But then the next day it would be melted enough that you could drive and still be okay. And then it would be melt. And then it would be like gone completely, like watered down, soggy mess, in like two days. Here in New Hampshire, you know, I'm probably going to have to deal with blizzards, and there's just going to be ice upon ice and dry ice, and you know, very slick ice and freezing rain, and just you just so much more because the where we live, where I'm going to be living, there's just going to be accumulation of snow. I was actually up here um, for Liberty Forum, and I would see just these piles of snow just stacked to one side. Um, and here in New England, the roads are um, they're you know they're small and narrow because they're based from old horse trails, and they can't expand the roads because literal houses and businesses are right on the edges of roads. So if they were going to try and expand the roads, they would have to actually physically push the houses and the businesses back, and they can't do that. So um, by contrast, it's going to be worse because the road, not only the roads here are smaller, but they pile up snow. So there's all this dirty snow just on the edge. So there's all the snow that sticks around for days, you know, even weeks and months. And then, you know, then we'll have new snow, and then that will go on top of the old ones. So... I think the winter share are going to be uh, quite a bit harsher. Oh, well, welcome to New Hampshire. <laughs> Yay! But you know what? I've lived in New England before, so I am totally prepared. Well, that's good. That's good. Now, uh, something else lead straight into this is that, like I said, I'm flying to Idaho next week, and um, the flight alone is going to be interesting. I've not ever been out west that far out west. So it'll it'll be a new experience. But I came across this article about the lovely TSA. As we all know, we all love the TSA. Um, They are now banning cell phones and laptops with dead batteries from overseas flights. Uh, What? (laughs) Yeah, this comes from Ben Swan's website. So it's it's fairly uh, reputable. And So the Transportation Security Administration has announced a new set of airline security policies that could complicate Americans' international travel plans. Uh, All electronic devices are screened by security officers. During the security examination, officers may also ask that owners power up some devices, including cell phones. Powerless devices will not be permitted on board the aircraft, and the traveler may also undergo additional screening. I... I'm so disgusted by this. I was terrorized a few years ago by the by the TSA at the airport, and I'll tell you, they wanted me to go through the scanner. I said, absolutely not. I will not be going through any scanners. 
Um, just the horror stories about cancer and radiation coming from those things, no way. Uh-uh. So they're like, well, you're going to have to be pat down. I was like, well, that's fine then. Pat me down because I'm not going through your ridiculous scanner. Now, these scanners that are supposed to be uh, totally random, you know, they don't make every single person go through the scanner. They randomly choose people. How I don't understand how random it is when the guy in front of me was required to go through the scanner, and now I am required to go through the scanner. That's not acceptable to me. So I had to wait to be pat down, and I put my laptop in the bucket to go through the x-ray machine. My laptop is just sitting there waiting for anybody to take it. I'm still detained behind the line, waiting for an officer to come pat me down. And I'm just like, man, my laptop is right there. Please, could you just take it out of the sight of people so nothing happens to it? And she's like, just keep an eye on it, ma'am. And I was like, look, if I run to go get my laptop to go after somebody who might take it, you all will throw me in jail. You're telling me to keep an eye on it. If somebody grabs it and I run after them because I went behind the line, you guys will throw me in jail. Please, grab my laptop for me. Ma'am, just keep an eye on it. So I'm sitting here watching my laptop from behind a line where somebody could just do something, anything to my laptop, take it, steal it, whatever. They wouldn't do anything about it. Um, And I'm waiting for somebody to come pat me down. So they start patting me down. And I get over to back over to the line when they realize I'm not concealing anything. And then they tell me, oh, well, we're going to have to scan your stuff again because your bottles look bigger on the screen than they really are. So to terrorize me even further, they made them recheck my bottles and recheck my bags to make sure that I didn't have unapproved bottles in my suitcase. And they were they were standard issue regulation specifically made for airports. I did this ahead of time. I'm not stupid. And my my eyes. I was crying when I went to go put my shoes back on because they made me feel like a criminal. They totally violated me. And so now that they're talking about international flights, they're going to start screening people's cell phones and screening people's um, laptops with dead batteries or saying that they can't fly if they have dead batteries. This is just more violation against people, against humanity. Yes, it absolutely is. You know, it, with the um, with them coming back and saying, "Oh, you know, you're allowed to power your phones and electronic devices during takeoff because, oops, we found out that it actually does not interfere with flight patterns." Here they come around with another curveball and say, "Okay, you need to make sure that your stuff has juice so that we have the ability to look at it when it's on because if it's off, we don't know if you're trying to sabotage us or do anything criminal." And it's just, uh, it's just, it's really disgusting. And actually, um. Some, you know, this is kind of something that you can try to do and get back at the TSA. You know, it's only a little bit, but it's kind of humorous. Um, someone said that uh, what she did was that she froze her bottles of water uh, in her freezer and then was taken through security, and they told her she couldn't because they were bottles of water, and she said they're solid, not liquid. What's the problem? And they didn't have a way to argue with that, so they let her through. And then someone else posted, yes, I've done this for years, and, you know, they pretty much leave me alone, but whenever they do say it, I give them that argument, and then they let me go. So I don't know if you want to try and find, use that to get back at them, but it would save you $5 from spending on another water bottle because we all know how expensive those bottles of water are. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Somebody else said, uh, posted a meme on Facebook that I just saw today that said, okay, so... You, I have an unopened bottle of water. You won't let me take it in because you say something could be in it, but then you promptly throw it in the garbage can. If there is something wrong with that water, why are you promptly throwing it in the garbage can among hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of people? Yeah, why aren't you taking it to be screened or any or taste tested? Yeah, they they make no sense and they know it. Um, yes, absolutely, they know it. Um, you know, I'm not thrilled with the idea of flying. I'm not a good flyer as it is. That's a long, long trip. I mean, with the time changes and all that, I think it's going to take me like five hours. Um, and then on the flight home, it's a red-eye flight. So I leave about 9.20 at night. I'm not getting back till 5.30 in the morning the next day. Whoa, how is that possible? That's crazy. I've never even heard of a – well, you're flying out from Salt Lake, and Salt Lake's a fairly sizable airport, so I guess I can kind of understand that. 
Well, both flights also have a layover of an hour and a half in Denver. Oh, okay. So I will have a short layover in Denver twice, but Denver is like supposed to be the hub of where all that satanic um, murals. It's supposed to be a big Mason airport, and it's got satanic murals all over the place. You know, that's that was hilarious when you showed me about that. I'm like, uh, I have been through Denver like several, several times, and I've never actually seen it. But then again, I don't really go and openly search for that kind of thing. So I don't know if that's something you're going to have to actually like really do an investigation for. But, but if you do see it, by all means, let me know because that would be kind of hilarious. Oh, I will. I will. And um, I just want to say I just saw Proof Negative pop into the chat room. You guys should stick around. we got about five minutes left in our show, but stick around from 9 to 12 Eastern, uh, which is 6 to 9 Pacific. I always have to think about that. Um, he's going to be on the air. You guys should stick around and listen. I co-host with him on Tuesday nights, and I think it is Cecilia who is his co-host on Wednesdays. So I hope you guys will stick around and listen. Uh, again, you can catch our show on the Voluntary Virtues Network tomorrow. Uh, from 4 to 6 Eastern, on that, that's on YouTube. And I've had a really good time tonight. Um, you're always my favorite host when John Moreland can't be with us. Yay! I have so much fun hosting with you, too. This has been very fun. I'm glad that we got to kind of steer it off differently and talk about other not so um, political activist things because you know what, uh, you know as much as I love talking about it, sometimes I can get old and boring. You want to escape and talk about, hey, let's talk about ponies and rainbows and Animal Crossing. Yeah, and I don't watch ponies, and I haven't played Animal Crossing, but I certainly will keep the idea in mind. I actually really am excited about trying Animal Crossing sometime. You and I, we usually shoot zombies together. <laughs> We're usually shooting zombies, but I'd like to play a game that actually has a libertarian theme to it. If you ever get into Minecraft, man, do let me know and you can play on my Minecraft server. <laughs> oh, boy, I've got the hookup. My kids, my kids, they love Minecraft. I have yet to figure out what the appeal of it is. I guess I will find out if I ever decide to play it. It's just, it's just basically like 3D Legos. You get to create lots of really cool things, and you get different skins, that you, like different skins like avatars that you can play as. Like currently, I have a Doctor Who skin theme going on. Um, another friend of ours that plays uh, has a Creeper skin. So you know, just you know, it's definitely a. I mean, it's definitely a game for those that are a little bit that are a little more creative or want to try and create some things. Sometimes I play it and I'm like, I have no idea what I want to do, but then just to create a Jesus flow, and you know, before I know it, I have a giant tower that's going to be overlooking all of my kingdom. So, yay! <laughs> I will certainly have to give that a shot. Um, I hope that you all have enjoyed the Vagina Two Hours 2.0. Um, I'm sure we will have you on again soon. And uh, John Borland's supposed to be back with us next week. So if he is, we certainly won't be talking about rappers or talk about video games and probably won't be talking about ponies. So I do hope that you all enjoyed a little break from our usual serious topic. I'm going to end the show now with a song called There is Love by our friend uh, Harrison Ray. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks, Danica, and we'll see you guys next week. All right. Take care, everybody.